Well, thank you, Victoria, and good morning, everyone. Let me welcome you to this Sunday morning worship of the First Baptist Church of Sun Lakes. We're absolutely delighted that you have come to join us this morning. And if you happen to be watching live on the internet, we are absolutely thrilled that you have come uh, to join us as well. If you're visiting with us here in the worship center, we are delighted that you have chosen to come and worship with us. And we invite you to visit our welcome table, which is in the foyer behind you. Someone will be there to greet you at the end of the service. They will present you with a gift, and that gift is a, a little blue bag that comes with some information uh, about our church and also a couple of books that we know will be an inspiration and a blessing and an encouragement to you. So we encourage you to visit the welcome table at the end of uh, the service. Just a few announcements. The Women in Focus group will be continuing their Bible study Tuesday morning at 9.30 in the CLC. That Bible study is titled Take Courage. So uh, if you haven't uh, been to the Bible study or joined the Bible study, you're welcome to come in and do that at any time. Also, let me also mention about the Women in Focus group. I won't talk too much about it, but there's an insert in your worship guide about what they're going to be doing on the 12th, a week from Tuesday, and I'll trust that you will go ahead and take a look at that on your own. Let me mention also there are three committee meetings this week, Social Committee, Building and Grounds, and the Missions Committee. If you're on any one of those committees, please take note of the day and the time. It's really, really important that you would come and attend those meetings. And speaking of the social committee meeting, uh, which is tomorrow, you probably noticed down in the hallway, if you came in this way, there's going to be a potluck on Sunday, April 24th, after the worship service. You can sign up today, tomorrow, or rather next Sunday and the next Sunday as well. And the potluck, of course, is absolutely free. They will give you all of the information of, of what items that you uh, can bring. They're going to supply the main dish. So sign up uh, after the service this morning or next week as well. Good Friday service, a week from this coming Friday on the 15th. We hope that you will in, in, uh, join us Friday evening for that. The Lord's Supper will be served at the Good Friday service. If you happen to have a phone with you this morning, this would be just a really, really good time to make sure that it is off. We greatly, greatly appreciate your cooperation week by week. <laughs> well, at least they're listening, so that's a good thing, you know. As we begin our worship service this morning, Pastor George is going to come and join us, Pastor George. Let's give glory to our risen, conquering Son. Because he lives, we shall live also. Let's stand and sing, shall we?
Amen. Be seated, please. This week I came across an article that I found very encouraging. We all need encouragement, don't we? A Canadian pastor by the name of Tim Challies wrote the article focusing on just how much he needed Sunday, the Lord's Day. As he stood to worship on a certain Sunday, he found himself thinking about the Lord's Day as a gift from God to us. He says the Lord's Day is water for the parched runner, a meal for the hungry pilgrim, a rest for the weary worker, a celebration to the sorrowful, a reunion to the lonely, an education for the ignorant, assurance for the guilty sinner, and rescue to the unforgiven. The pastor goes on to say, as life progresses, I more and more find the Lord's Day not just as the starting point of a new week, but the center point of my existence. I cannot, will not, could not make it through life without it. I'm eternally thankful to God for so kindly providing and prescribing it. I agree with him. The Lord's Day is certainly the high point of my week and I trust that it is for you as well. This day, as you know, offers spiritual resources to keep us going. Not for the whole race ahead of us, but certainly for the next week in front of us. Let us say with King David in Psalm 122 verse one, I was glad, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Would you pray with me this morning? What a privilege, Father, to be where we are, worshiping the living God together with brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for the Lord's day. Thank you for the privilege of coming here and spending time focusing on you and doing it with others, focusing on your word, lifting our voices in praise. Oh Lord, we acknowledge your goodness and grace in giving us the resources and the refreshment we need. We have spiritual life because of you. We have breath in our bodies because of you. We have joy in our daily activities because of you. And we have hope for the future, a solid, unshakable hope because of who you are and because of what Jesus accomplished on our behalf at the cross of Calvary and through his bodily resurrection from the dead. Oh, we are a blessed people for along with millions of people around the world, you have purchased us for yourself. How could we ever thank you enough? All glory be to you, O oh Lord. Father, I ask you to help us lift our voices of praise to you in song as we sing biblical truth together. And I ask that you open our hearts to your word that we may go deeper and come out stronger than ever before. Not simply for our sakes, but that we will be more usable proclaimers of your glorious gospel. And all of this I pray in the majestic, wondrous name of our Redeemer, our Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only Son to make a wretch his treasure. 
How great the pain of searing loss The Father turns His face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon a cross My sin upon his shoulders Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished I will not boast in anything No gifts, no power, no I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom Why should I gain from His reward? I can I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom His wounds have paid my And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? Let's sing it together, shall we? <laughs> for 
should love me that he would die for me. God help us to sing it with all our heart, the wonder of it all. There's the wonder of sunset.
that pretty much says it all, doesn't it? <laughs> the wonder of it all, that God loves me. I was thinking about what a theologian said, God knows everything there is to know about us and still loves us. <laughs> and that's exactly right, isn't it? And we have the privilege of making known God's love to our world. And your faithful giving week by week contributes toward getting that message literally to the ends of the earth, along with thousands and thousands of other Bible-believing churches. We give so that the gospel might spread and the name of Jesus might be exalted around the world. What a privilege to give. As you may know, I mention this from time to time, but as you may know, uh, our offering plates are toward the back right before you go through those double doors into the main foyer if that's convenient for you. But above all, we worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and want our lives, our ministries, our giving, everything to point others to the only one who can change them for time and eternity. I'm going to ask Merle Zaylor to come and lead us as we dedicate our tithes and our offerings to the Lord. I have to bring this down to my size. <laughs> Good morning, church. I'm glad you're all here today. Would you join me today in prayer? Father, you are the great and the mighty. You are holy and worthy of praise. We humble ourselves before you in your mighty power. We are so grateful for the amazing love and grace that draws us ever nearer and closer to you. Father, we come to you now to ask for your great blessings to be poured out upon those who return a portion of what you have allowed us. Thank you, Lord, for the generosity that abounds in this, your church. May our tithes and offerings bring satisfaction and joy to our hearts, knowing that they are used in love. They're used to save the lost, Lord. May you give us direction and guidance in the use of these funds to bring many souls into the kingdom of God. We pray this today in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ.
Let's sing it together. Sing like never before. Turn to, I sing the mighty power of God. Let's sing it together, number 48. What a joy to know that power and to rejoice in it every day. Well, I'll ask you, if you will, please, to turn to Acts chapter 9 with me this morning. And Lord willing, we are going to finish this chapter. Lord willing. If the rapture happens before I get through... I will not finish Acts chapter 9, <laughs> and you'll understand, right? I trust you'll be with me as we go up. That's going to be an amazing day, isn't it? Wow. Aren't, aren't you glad that day's coming? That's the promise of Jesus. He said he's coming back. <laughs> he, amen. <laughs> he is coming back. And the worse this nation gets and this world gets, the more we long for his return. Now, I didn't plan to preach a pre-sermon this morning, <laughs> but I'm just excited. Acts chapter 9, two remarkable stories here, and I'll begin reading in verse 32. If you'd like to stand with me, you may do so at this time. Verse 32. Now, as Peter went here and there among them all, he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, bedridden for eight years, who was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose. And all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. 
Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days she became ill and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. Would you pray with me? Father, you are the eternal God, the miracle-working God, the God who hears and answers prayer And we say to you, be all glory, all praise. In Christ's holy name, we pray together, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, thus far, we have considered the dramatic conversion and early ministry of Saul. That first century terrorist and public enemy number one, at least as far as the Christians were concerned. Now, at this point, the book of Acts moves to the ministry of the apostle Peter, although it comes back to Paul in later chapters, particularly chapter 13, as he begins his missionary journeys. Now, beginning in verse 33 of Acts 9, we are introduced to two people who each received a miracle from God. The first miracle showed the power of Jesus over disease, and the second miracle showed the power of Jesus over death. The first could be called a miracle of restoration, and the story here centers on a man by the name of Aeneas, a man who was a suffering person. That's so clear in our text, isn't it? He was a suffering person. Verse 33 says he was paralyzed and that he had been bedridden for eight years. Now, eight years is a long time to be bedridden, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, with no end in sight. No doubt in the midst of this man's pain, He had a sense of uselessness as well as a loss of income. Perhaps he felt himself to be a burden to his family and had no hope of ever overcoming his debilitating illness. We can only imagine the yearnings in this man's heart. Perhaps he longed day after day to be able to somehow, someday feed himself or to know the satisfaction of a good day's work, or perhaps to feel the Mediterranean splash against his ankles on a summer day. Well, whatever his yearnings were, he was about to see them come true. So although he was a suffering person, he was not without hope, for the next truth shows us supernatural power. Do you see that? We're moving from a suffering person to a supernatural power. Look at verse 34 with me, if you would. Verse 34. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose. 
Now notice that the emphasis here is completely on Jesus as the healer, right? Peter didn't hang up a shingle and say, y'all come on in and I'll heal you. No, of course not. Peter's emphasis was on Jesus and what he was able to do. In fact, the grammatical tense in this verse is such that Peter was literally saying, this instant Jesus Christ is healing you. Just imagine being in that man's condition and hearing Peter say those words and then finding out that they were true. I mean, when Peter said, rise, Aeneas rose. When Peter said, make your bed, he made his bed. When I was a kid, if my parents said, make your bed, I made my bed. But it wasn't because I had been healed and was now able to do it. No, if I had refused to do it, I probably would have needed some healing <laughs> at that point. But you see the point here, Aeneas did what he did because he was now able to do it. He could get up, he could walk, he could go wherever he wanted to go, and it was all because the supernatural power of Jesus had invaded his body and brought a remarkable change. But there's more. <laughs> there's more. Not only do we see a suffering person and a supernatural power, thirdly, we see a significant purpose. Don't miss this a significant purpose. Look with me at verse 35. And all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him. That is to say, Aeneas, the healed man, they saw him. What does the next line say? And they turned to the Lord. So you see, the word got out about this miracle and people came to see the man who had been healed. But more than that, much more than that, they turned to the healer himself, the Lord Jesus, and they experienced sins forgiven and life eternal. So this physical healing was not an end in itself, not at all, but rather a means to another end, that of new life through the Messiah. You see, if the healing had simply been an end in itself, Jesus would have healed all of the sick people. But he was using this physical healing, great as it was, for a much greater healing, and that's the healing of the soul. So this miracle was for the purpose of opening a door for the gospel and to spread abroad the name of Jesus. Now, having seen the miracle of restoration, let's consider next for a moment. And this is exciting, isn't it? The miracle of resurrection. This miracle centers on a woman by the name of Dorcas, as we read in our text. First of all, I want us to notice her deeds, her deeds. Verse 36 says, there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was what? She was full of good works and acts of charity. Now, Joppa was a small seaport town, and there was a church there of which Dorcas was a member. Interestingly, her name means gazelle, and gazelles are graceful antelopes. And so you could say that Dorcas lived up to her name. She was a graceful, gracious person who did not live for herself, but rather for God and for others. And yet, as you know, in our culture today, there is such an emphasis on living for self. But have you ever thought about the things Jesus did not say? <laughs> for example, he never said, listen to your heart. Be true to yourself. Feel good about who you are. Happiness is what matters. Just be a good person. God helps those who help themselves. No, Jesus did not say those things. But in Scripture, we see the things that Jesus actually did say. For example, in Luke 9, verse 23, 
He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Well, I would say that was true of Dorcas. For verse 36 calls her a disciple. That is to say she was a follower of Jesus. And she was one who denied herself and loved and served others, especially showing love and compassion to the poor. Yes, good works are important. They do not earn a person salvation, but they do give evidence of salvation having taken place. Now, Dorcas did not aspire to be a leader or a hero. She simply desired to use her gifts through her home. And what a ministry she had out of that home. <laughs> As you see in our text, she made things for people. She was gifted in providing tunics, doing embroidery. She had a needle in her hand, and it was marvelous to behold how God had gifted her and how because of her commitment to the Savior, he was using her in the community and in the church family in such marvelous ways. You could say that Dorcas was a Proverbs 31 kind of woman. The inward grace, think about it like this, the inward grace in her life prompted the outward deeds. But then secondly, we see, sadly, the death of Dorcas. Verse 37 says, in those days she became ill and died. We don't know what happened. We're not told. We don't have to know. We're just simply told that she became ill in the midst of all of this, in the midst of her charitable work, in the midst of her loving service to others, she had to lay down that needle. She became ill and died. And once that happened, the disciples sent for Peter, as we see in verse 38. In fact, he was urged to come to them without delay. So the disciples in Joppa were apparently hoping that Peter might raise Dorcas from the dead. In fact, they did not even bury her. Did you see that in the text a moment ago? They placed her body in a room, <laughs> hoping for a miracle. Somebody go get Peter. God's using him. So two men were sent to fetch Peter. Yes, there were the deeds of Dorcas, the death of Dorcas. Aren't you glad it doesn't end at this point? What do we see thirdly? What do we see? The deliverance of Dorcas. As we see in verse 40, Peter knelt down and prayed. Then turning to the body, he called Dorcas by her Aramaic name, saying, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. Now we might wonder what Peter prayed in that moment. I mean, after all, Dorcas was not simply ill at this point. She was dead. So what does a person say in a prayer that God uses to raise the dead back to life? We will never know this side of heaven. Perhaps when we see Peter someday, We'll ask him to tell us about it. But one thing's for sure. Peter would give all the glory to God, recognizing that only God can perform such a miracle. So after his prayer, Peter told Dorcas to arise. Perhaps at that moment, her eyelids suddenly quivered. Then her eyes opened what must Peter have felt when Dorcas looked at him? And imagine the emotions of the people as Dorcas walked out the door. The Bible says in verse 41 that Peter presented her alive. I love those words right there. 
verse 41. He presented her alive. He didn't walk out to where the people were. I guess I better stay behind the microphone. <laughs> That's hard to do for me. He didn't walk out to where the people were and say, I gave it my best shot, folks. I tried. She's not moving. No, Dorcas comes out. And I'm sure she picked her needle back up. She said, let me get at it. I was in the middle of something. Didn't finish it because I got sick and died. But as you can see, I am no longer dead. I'm here to serve. I'm here to minister. I'm here to fulfill the calling that God has placed upon my life for as long as he would have me do it. I'm convinced she went right back to it. Peter presented her a lot. You know why I love that so much? Because those words are a picture of our salvation. We were dead in our sins and trespasses as we see in Ephesians 2. We followed the course of this world, Paul says. We were sons of disobedience, living in the passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. <laughs> That's a pretty dismal picture, don't you think? However, beginning in verse 4 of Ephesians 2, Paul says, but God, oh, wait a minute. That changes everything, everything. You see, there's no life apart from him, no hope apart from him, no forgiveness and freedom apart from him. Aren't you thankful for those two words, but God? The passage in Ephesians 2 says, but God being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and, I love this, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Well, I could preach on that passage for a while, but we need to come back to Acts 9. When Peter presented her alive, we get a picture of what has happened to believers spiritually. <clears throat> right? Dorcas experienced a physical resurrection. You and I, as Christians, have experienced a spiritual resurrection. Aren't you glad you're no longer dead? I mean, really. No longer dead in sin, separated from God. No hope in this world. But through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and the fact that we have placed our faith in Him alone for the gift of eternal life, we are no longer dead. We have been raised spiritually. We have new life in Christ. We are new creations in Him. The old has passed away. The new has come. We belong to Him lock, stock, and barrel. Praise His name. Amen. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love what he said. He presented her alive. You and I have been presented alive. And I am so thankful for that. We were dead in sin, but then convicted by the Holy Spirit. Then we were redeemed by the Savior. And then we were presented, not dead, but alive. Therefore, through the power of God, we have been raised to new life in Christ. And I love this thought. We have been adopted into his family. We have become heirs of God. And fellow heirs with Christ, we're told in Romans 8. Now, what happened after Dorcas was raised from the dead? What happened? 
after all the ooing and aahing, picking the needle back up, going to work, what happened? What ha- well, look at verse 42. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. That's what happened. So once again, we see the results of what God did through Peter. Peter didn't do it. God did it through him. And I'm not just referring to the impact on Aeneas and Dorcas. I'm talking about the far-reaching spiritual impact on many people as a result of these miracles. You'll recall that after Aeneas was healed, verse 35 says, All the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. What a move of God. All the residents in that region saw the man who had been healed and understood that the Messiah had come, and they placed their faith in him. They turned to the Lord. And now, after the resurrection of Dorcas, what do we see? We see the same result. The little seaport of Joppa rocked with the news of this miracle, this resurrection. Verse 42 says, and it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. So, it's one thing to experience a physical miracle. Thank God for that. But it's something else entirely to experience a spiritual miracle, which, of course, will last eternally. So let's think about this in closing. The raising of Dorcas was only a foretaste of heaven, for she would die again. But because she was a follower of Jesus... She will live eternally. For all who are in Christ will be presented to him, right? The heavenly bridegroom. All who are in Christ will be presented to him alive in order to live forever in his presence. With no more tears, no more pain, no more sin, no more death. Aren't you thankful that because Jesus lives, we live. Because he reigns, you and I will reign with him throughout all eternity, world without end. That's the promise of God. Jesus not only provides resurrection, as he told Martha, he is the resurrection and the life. And so those who are in him have been raised spiritually. But there's another resurrection coming. Somebody asked me this question the other day. (laughs) I love resurrection type questions. Someone asked me about the timing in all of this, and I won't go into a bunch of detail at this point. But the Bible teaches that the moment a person comes to faith in Christ, that person is raised from spiritual death into spiritual life. But also... The day is coming when the bodies of believers will be raised from the grave. And they won't be like these bodies. We'll have the same body, essentially, but it will be a transformed, glorified, perfect body that will never, ever know any suffering of any kind. Do you ever have any suffering of any kind? (laughs) We all do. We all do. I love what theologian D.A. Carson said. There's nothing wrong with me that a good resurrection wouldn't take care of. (laughs) I can identify with that. Probably you can as well. The good news is this. That resurrection is coming. And we will spend all eternity with our Savior face to face. One day in new bodies that will never grow old. You might run across someone you haven't seen and say, oh, I don't know, 5,000 years. <laughs> and you will not say to that person, you know, you've, you've aged some. <laughs> and the guy says, and you haven't? No, there won't be any conversation like that. 
Because as an old song says, we'll never grow old in that place. God has thought of everything in terms of power for the presence and glory for the future. He's thought of everything, but that doesn't surprise us, does it? He's God, we're not. (laughs) He's on his throne. He's at work. All glory be to him. Let's pray together. Father, we confess gladly that you are reigning. You have always reigned. You are now. And you always will be on the throne, reigning throughout all eternity. Oh, Father, thank you for the promise that one day we will be there. And we will be rejoicing and singing and worshiping and fellowshipping with other believers and reigning. I don't even know what all of that means, but I know as believers we will reign with you throughout eternity. I pray that in the meantime, oh Lord, as long as our lives last on this earth, May we seek you with all our heart. May we not be distracted by lesser matters. May we seek you, love you, worship you, walk with you every day of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What else could we sing but our God reigns. Let's stand, rejoice together, worship him. He is reigning. How lovely on the mountain are the feet of him who brings good news. Good news announcing peace, proclaiming news of happiness.